Susan Lee, welcome to the program. You've said you want the Prime Minister to take responsibility uh, on this. What does that mean? Do you want the federal government to pick up the tab for these games? Well, David, if our athletes behaved like Daniel Andrews and Anthony Albanese, we wouldn't win any gold medals because those two, frankly, have just given up. So there is no leadership from this Prime Minister. And there are many things that he could be doing to restore our international reputation. Likewise. By the way, where is Annika Wells, the sports minister? Happy to pop up in a photo op with the Matildas during the week, but nowhere to be seen. Missing in action. Radio silence. You just heard Richard Miles bumbling and stumbling. Nothing to do with us. There really is an issue of Australia's international reputation. This is an international embarrassment. So just coming back to the question, do you want the federal government to pick up the tab? I want both Daniel Andrews and Anthony Albanese to explore creative solutions. The problem with like, this is like it's, what? been, What's a it's been presented solution? as a binary choice, David. It's been presented as it costs $7 billion or you don't have it at all. Mm. How about looking at alternatives? How about looking at other states, other nations stepping in? How about having the reasonable conversation with the Commonwealth Games Federation about how we can help, how we can take responsibility? Now, the Commonwealth supported financially the... Gold Coast Games, and no doubt they would have tipped some money into this as well. Mm. We don't know the details of that conversation. But I don't accept that as our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, can simply step back and take no responsibility. And I've got a suggestion, by the way, for all of the athletes. Don't have your photo taken with any Labor MPs until this gets sorted out. Right. There should be a, what, a, a blockade, a ban on any... Photo opportunity. Well, there should, be, there should be a really strong message going to the Prime Minister. Already there's a strong message going to Daniel Andrews that this is just not good enough. The Prime, the Prime Minister, he didn't uh, bid for these games. This was not his mm -hmm. idea. But you're saying he now should what, take charge of sorting out where the Commonwealth Games should be held in 2026? He should take some responsibility. I'm not saying he should put the games on at Commonwealth costs at any, you know, uh, any cost. I'm not saying that at all. So I'm what saying exactly explore, should he do? Explore creative solutions, which might include the states around Australia contributing, another country contributing, at least look for an outcome that restores our international reputation. Okay. Because where it is right now is pretty low and that affects everyone and Do you think, elite we, we, sport we, we, matters, David. Yeah, we've, got a, we've got a big elite sport event going on right now and, and it's going pretty well so far. Do you really think this has damaged Australia? Absolutely I do. I used to be the sports minister. I know the role that elite sport plays, not just at the level of that sport, but for every community, for those regional Victorian communities, for those children who see our athletes as their future inspiration, for what it does for activity, for society, for culture, uh, let alone the broken promises that the Premier's made. I mean, they've been talked about enough. So it actually does matter. The Commonwealth Games, the World Championships, the Olympic Games, they're all part of our international standing. And that's a responsibility this Prime Minister needs to actually take seriously. Let's turn to uh, cost of living pressures. You've been uh, flying around the country this week talking about uh, cost of living. You've visit visited the Scarborough Boat Harbour Brewery up in Queensland, uh, the Brunetti's Cake Shop down in Melbourne as well. Amongst those lining up for uh, boutique beers and, and tiramisu, did you run into anyone really struggling on Job Seeker? I did. I ran into small businesses who were really struggling. I was in Malvern in, in Melbourne and I saw a strip of shops which were just one for lease sign after the other. I walk into small businesses every day in the places you've mm. mentioned and in other locations where people say they haven't had any customers. They show me their electricity bill, they show me their rent bill. They tell me how difficult it is. And I don't think this government is taking the cost of living seriously. We handed them an economy that was record low in employment with a resources boom. What unfortunately they have done is not look properly at a plan to manage inflation. And what they've done is introduce risk into the economy. Their ham-fisted intervention in the electricity, in the energy market. They're playing with industrial relations. And the effect that this is having, I'm seeing the effect of what they've done since they came into government well, one, I, on our small yeah. businesses and workers. The question is about job seeker, and one of the things they're trying to do is increase the rate of job seeker. This was announced in the May budget. Have you decided yet whether to support that? Well, Peter Dutton talked about people who are on JobSeeker being able to earn more mm. I'll come and to therefore that, he... encourage them back into the workforce. Mm. So I think that's a good thing. Well, all right, well just on that, mm. given you've raised it, this was the centrepiece announcement from Peter Dutton in his mm. budget reply back in May. Do you know yet what that would cost? 
we know that it would introduce productivity into the workplace. But what would we'll it cost? Go, we'll, we'll go through those costings. But right now... You don't now, have them yet? Well, businesses are crying out for workers, David. All of those costings and all of those policy details will come. But politicians quite need some... to know what something costs before committing to it, surely. But more importantly, they need to attach themselves to a principle. The principle here is that the economy has record low unemployment and that for you as an individual, your pathway to a better place in life is always through a job. Let's help you. But don't you Let's not to... punish you. Don't Let's you not demonise out... you. Let's support don't you. Don't you need to work out what something costs, though? And we will. And I'm quite relaxed about a strong policy position when will we that see backs that? in our job seekers in due course. Right. Day. When will we see the cost of it? Well, we'll see the cost in due course. It's not for me to actually give you a date here on your program. But so it, it is, is for me... it is still coming. It is still coming. It is. But it is for me to say that these principles... Another one we took was the pensioner workforce bonus. How we break down barriers to employment so we can make the workforce more productive. This is critical because this is what we need to do right, to then. actually add productivity where the government is taking it away. If the government won't take up that uncosted idea, will you still vote for or against their increase in job seeker? Let's see the legislation. Let's have a close look at it. But the principle is the one I want to come back to, David, which is that we often talk about the amount that people get paid on JobSeeker, and I know it's really tough. But I also know that when we have so many jobs and so many um, mm. businesses desperate to fill those jobs, there is a job for someone and there is a training pathway for someone and there is support for someone. And if we can help you by saying you can earn more while you're on job seeker, that's a good thing for you. I'm looking at the social benefit here. You've been talking too a lot about energy prices and the Coalition's uh, answer to this now appears to be going nuclear mm. uh, and you've become a convert on this too. As Environment Minister, you rejected a push from some of your colleagues to lift the ban on nuclear power in Australia. Why have you had a change of heart in opposition? Next generation nuclear makes sense. If you look at the way the energy market is being smashed, which means households and businesses are being smashed right now with rising electricity prices, what we need to do is de-risk investment in the energy market. We need to boost supply, particularly of gas, and we need to have a serious look at nuclear. People are changing their mind, David. I saw a poll in Warringah, I think, last week, where more than 50% of people, particularly young people, are saying they want to see nuclear as part of the energy mix for the future. So, so it absolutely it, yeah. makes sense for clean, baseload energy. The only problem is, you, like, the CSIRO, for example, says it's far too expensive. So what's convinced you to change your mind? The next generation nuclear, the safety of it, the way that both small modular reactors and micro modular reactors are being considered by 50 countries around the world. The level of the debate, and look, Australians, just like me, David, are up for the conversation. So it's just that general level of debate that's changed your mind? It's, it's, the, it's the reality, the reality of the safety of next generation nuclear. Even and though some that, of the authorities here are saying it well, doesn't stack I, up. I think a lot of people are moving in a direction that actually is very positive about nuclear, just as I am. And if we want that clean baseload power and we genuinely want to reduce emissions, I say renewables need all the help they can get. Mm. I want to see renewables taken up in Australia. I want to see that pathway. I don't agree with the way the government is, as I said, smashing households and businesses in a way that actually makes them close down, makes them unaffordable, sends manufacturing overseas. We need, so to, do it, this. Yeah, okay. we need to do this sensibly. So is the, idea, part of the solution. is the idea with nuclear then, um, as I understand it, to have, the, have these reactions based where old coal-fired power stations are, so the La Trobe Valley, the Hunter Valley, they would be locations for well, nuclear people, power? People have talked about that and they sound quite sensible, but that's the next stage of the debate. debate. We actually need a government that's up for the conversation. Mm. Australians are up for the conversation, the Labor Party is not. The way they sneer and ridicule the genuine concern and commitment of average Australians about having clean baseload energy, and you, you would that be would be nuclear. To, you would be prepared to lift the ban on nuclear power in Australia? Well, that's part of it. And by the way, that has to happen. That actually has to happen anyway with AUKUS. So the government's being a bit tricky here. Um, well, we're talking about the ban on domestic use. Yes, we are. And, it, and, and obviously it's part of that. So it's you wouldn't lift that debate. ban? You have to. You have to, okay. you have to remove or alter that provision in the EPBC Act. Right, so that's now coalition policy. Well, let's wait and see what the government proposes. It's not about whether it's coalition policy or not. It was something I was looking at as Environment Minister with respect to the AUKUS initiative okay. that we brought in when we were in government, David. Let's turn to the uh, voice to Parliament. The Liberal Party wants to legislate an Indigenous voice. Can I ask why do you think Australia needs such a body? We need as parliamentarians and as organisations across this country to do all we can to close the gap 
the gap in Indigenous disadvantage. So we want, I want to see constitutional recognition of our first Australians. We've had that on our policy platform since John Howard when I came into Parliament. The problem is that Anthony Albanese has tied that constitutional recognition of our first Australians to a concept called the voice, which he cannot explain. My question is about why you think we need a voice, a legislated voice. Why do you think we need it? We would discuss what the legislated voice looked like and how it operated. Remember, we started local and regional voices when we were in government. So I have actually seen the way this has played out in regional mm. communities. What difference would it make? I mean, there's an argument from the no case that this would be uh, more bureaucracy. We don't have a layer of bureaucracy. Mm. We've got too much bureaucracy. But you do want this legislated voice. You don't think that would be unnecessary bureaucracy? Well, we would do it and we would support a model that didn't have unnecessary bureaucracy. So the voice is important in the way that it may close the gap and it way, it, in the way it may improve the lives of Indigenous right. people. But remember, there are a lot of organisations, there are a lot of uh, initiatives that are already in place. I've watched many of them over the years. But you think the voice could close the gap. Do you think it would re-racialise Australia as well, having a uniquely Indigenous voice to Parliament or not? Look, it's not an expression I'd use. I would always see it in terms of local communities and the practical outcomes that make a difference to them. And what I would like to see in a legislated voice is that local approach. I'm not seeing it. By the way, we don't know what the uh, constitutionally enshrined voice would look like because the Prime Minister seems to refuse to explain it. No, and we, don't, we don't know what the legislated voice would look like either, but, but you, are, but you in, have said this morning... But all legislation... Yeah, but, David, all legislation requires exposure drafts. Sure. It requires conversations. It requires debate. I mean, it requires all the things mm. that actually produce good legislation at the end of a process, mm. and that's what I want to see. But I want to see it link to local communities so it's not no, one national body coming out of Canberra. It's a voice that comes from each community because every community has a different view and so they should. But you have said here this morning that you do think a voice could help close the gap. So what is the concern about enshrining that in the Constitution? The way that the unnecessary bureaucracy would be associated with a constitutionally enshrined voice. We've said that's risky, we've said it's unknown, we've said it's divisive and we've said it's but permanent. Why do you think point... it's risky? What, just explain to me who you're relying on to suggest it would be risky the... to enshrine this in the Constitution. Well, when you talk about litigation through the High Court with executive power and the reach and influence of the voice, that, to me, adds risk. The risk is the slowing down but of you business decisions. Are you relying on anyone's advice here? Because there's a long list of former High Court Chief Justice Robert French, uh, who says there's little or no scope of constitutional litigation. Your Liberal colleague, Julian Lisa, who says this is safe change. I mean, experts from Brett Walker to Anne Toomey are all very comfortable with this. Who are you there's, relying on? There's experts saying lots of different things. Like who? What, well, there are experts in the Yes case who said things differently earlier on in the Yes case, and I don't want to name individuals. But in describing the reach and influence of the voice and the way that it would entrench bureaucracy and slow down decision-making, that's what concerns me. Because I've seen how decisions in this country have been slowed down to the detriment of local communities. But that's not we, the view we, of most of these experts, the overwhelming majority of constitutional experts. Well, David, constitutional experts have their place. Ordinary Australians and their views also have their place. And by the way, this is a debate that needs to be between ordinary Australians. But so when you're talking I'm about not, constitutional risk... I'm not lecturing risk, anybody. No, but when you're talking about constitutional risk, as you are, surely you've got to listen to some constitutional experts. Mm. And the reach that the voice would have via the executive power of government and the description of how it would be able to influence every area of government tells me that it would have considerable power and that power would be risky, divisive and is unknown. Now, if all of this is going to work well, why hasn't Anthony Albanese called a constitutional convention? Why are well, we having argue the that's debate? What the well, dialogues were. Well, well, he's saying... No, he's actually saying, we'll do this afterwards. You know what? If I was someone who supported the Yes case, I'd be pretty disappointed in the Prime Minister right now. He's avoiding the question, not fighting for his point of view. You heard that this week on his interview on 2GB, where he got abrasive, he got snippy, he backed away, he said, oh, it's not about treaty, it's not about this. He didn't even step up with the courage of the argument that he should be having for the Yes case. And as I said to Parliament, David, it's OK to vote yes. It's OK to vote no. I'll be voting no with a heavy heart because 
this is not the model that will produce the outcomes that I want to see and that I know are missing. Just finally, uh, on the challenge to your pre-selection, uh, people in leadership positions in the Liberal Party aren't often challenged for pre-selection. I think the last was John Hewson. Scott Morrison stepped in in the last term of Parliament to protect you from pre-selection. Do you think Peter Dutton should do the same? Well, David, it's a good question for you to ask and people are asking me those questions and you won't be surprised that I can't go into the details of um, party decisions and processes. I will say this though, I've pr been proud to be the Liberal member for Farrah since 2001. I stand by my record. Um, anyone can put up their hand through a pre-selection process. I agree, it's a bit unusual. What I'm fighting for is the people that I meet every day. When I hear that more than 50% of Australians, if they got a bill unexpectedly today, they wouldn't be able to pay it. But I guess That's the, what gets yeah, me up and gets me The question is, I, I suppose, about everybody. process here, do, do you support a rank and file pre-selection or do you think the leader should step in again? Rank and file pre-selections absolutely should have their place okay. and if I go through that, I'll go through that. I can't talk about the details of it because the party rules prevent but Would you rather Peter Dutton step in and stop it? I'm very happy to put myself forward on my record as the Liberal member of my seat of Farrah okay. for 22 years. And David. is Peter Dutton supporting you? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, he is. Susan Lee, thanks very much for joining Thank us. Thank you.